Hello, everyone. I'm Julian Ryan J of J Ryan Partners. I'm the chair of the SIO um, Stories in Organization. I'd like to welcome to you to a very special event. It's our November Story Lab, which will be hosted by Tom Sparrow and with our special, special guest, um, Pete Griffin. And before we get started, I want to give a special shout out to both of them for being their longtime board members, and they're both stepping off this year, but continue to stay in touch with us and connect it. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, to lead the way. Yeah, thank you, Jules. And it's great to see everybody today. It's great to have such a strong showing of our board uh, on the call today. And it's my pleasure to introduce Pete Griffin as our guest today for his presentation, Everyone Loves Smokey the Bear. <laughs> and he's got intimate details to share. Um, over the past seven years though, Pete has had various positions for the Storytelling and Organization Group. He's been the treasurer, the secretary, the vice chair, and he's been the newsletter editor. In other words, he's done just about everything. He's also uh, hosted and contacted some of the pre-conference speakers that we've had. Pete's had his finger in everything in the best possible way. But for 37 years, he was a valued employee of the family known as the US Forestry Service. And when he finished his career there with the Forestry Service, he was the district ranger for the Juneau, Alaska district. And this is a high profile job. When you talk with Pete, you might not realize this, but he was in charge as district ranger for the largest a section of forest in the United States. It's 3.5 million acres. Wow. So Pete was highly involved and it was known that Pete would walk every acre every day before his morning coffee. I'm kidding, of course. He <laughs> actually didn't walk, he rode a moose. <laughs> and of course, I'm still kidding because I've learned from his book, Stories of a Forest Ranger, <laughs> that you don't mess with the wildlife, whether it be a moose or a bear or a pregnant snake <clears throat> or a skunk. And uh, that's a special case. Uh, Pete is sometimes called the skunk whisperer and that is one of his stories uh, that's in his book. It's also on at least one of his CDs. I don't know if we're going there today, but uh, <laughs> it's a great story. Um, Pete, I just say a little bit more about Pete because he's been an advocate and a practitioner of stories for decades, but he kind of came into the storytelling world uh, in a non-traditional way, uh, which was organizationally. He learned the stories of old time forestry people and he passed them on and became an advocate in the organization to teach through story, to pass knowledge through story. And that's how he came to the National Storytelling Network organizationally with this interest in story. Um, he uh, won the regional award in Alaska for the Interpreter and Conservation Educator of the Year. And this was mainly because of his work in his five minute radio series, The Tongass Trail, um, which was part of National Public Radio. And he developed that. Uh, he also took some of his stories and created a one man play. And this play was recorded live. And in 2017, it won the Alaskan uh, Goldie for the best entertainment feature of the year. And if you ever go on an Alaskan cruise and you go on Disney or Princess Cruises, 
the naturalist on that cruise may well be pre Pete Griffin, <laughs> sharing his stories, his knowledge, and his photographs with all the people who take the cruises. It is such a delight to have Pete all these seven years, but here today uh, as our featured guest. Welcome, Pete. Uh, Tom, I don't want to cut you off. God, just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just getting started. He also brought in Andrew Tarvin, who is the humor engineer. Uh, and that's why I threw in a little humor, just because it's so peak. Well, well, I appreciate that. Uh, one minor correction is not Smokey the Bear. It's Smokey Bear. Ah. The name. Everybody gets said, well, but, but the song, the song, Smokey the Bear, Smokey the Bear. Well, the the songwriter had to throw that in there for the for the extra measure, but it is Smokey Bear, and and that's how I wanted to start. Everybody loves Smokey Bear, and this is uh, Smokey Bear was a uh, oh was conjured up during World War II when when there was concerns with uh, most of the young men overseas fighting. Uh, there wouldn't be anybody left to to fight forest fires in in the West in particular. So they wanted to reduce the number of forest fires and they came up with the idea of Smokey Bear. Uh, and what a successful program that was. Uh, in the late 40s, I believe it was, there was a fire in, uh, I believe it was New Mexico on the Lincoln National Forest and a, and a black bear cub was, was rescued. It was, uh, it was burned and they sent it to the, the National Zoo in Washington and that became uh, the, the living symbol of, of Smokey Bear. In 1984, there was a study done. And in, in this study, they asked adults if they could complete the phrase that began, only you. And 95% of the adults in that survey responded, only you can prevent forest fires. It, it, a, a, wildly successful uh, ad, ad program. And Smokey Bear was, was one of these stories I knew about the Forest Service before I joined in 1973. But that was the only story there was. Uh, uh, in, in the early 1980s, my wife and I uh, bought our first home. We'd been renting up to that point. And I'd always made cowboy coffee. You take one of those blue granite ware coffee pots with the large bottom and the, the skinnier top and a, and a top and a spout. And fill it with cold water, throw a couple of handfuls of coffee in it, bring it to just about a boil until the grounds turned over and, and went to the bottom. And then you let the coffee sit. You put in a cup of cold water, maybe a dash, dash of salt, tap the coffee pot with a spoon to make sure the, the grounds that were floating uh, would sink to the bottom. It, and it was wonderful coffee. But it took so long to make. So I, I, I bought a coffee pot with a timer on it, a, an automatic a drip coffee pot. And that was wonderful because we could make it up the night before, plug it in, set the timer. And when we got up in the morning, there was a cup of coffee waiting for me. And, and that was that was terrific, even though the coffee wasn't quite as good. But that continued for, oh gosh, maybe a year. And then it broke. The timer just gave up. Oh, shoot. Well, I was talking to my sister. And she uh, uh, lived in, in Little Rock at the time, Little Rock, Arkansas. And she said, oh, go send your coffee pot to me. And I'll take it to Walmart and get it replaced. I said, well, I, I didn't buy it at Walmart. And I don't have a receipt. And the warranty is, I'm sure, is long gone. And she said, oh, no, no, no. She said, Walmart's policy is, is that if you have an appliance and it no longer works, and if we sell that same make and model, we will replace that appliance free of charge. We're happy to do it. No questions asked. And I thought, huh, 
that, that's that's strange. Why would Walmart do that? I asked, and she said, "Well, you know, Sam Walton, the owner of Walmart, used to go to every one of his stores every year, and one year he came to our store, and and he told us a story." There was a woman whose house had burned down and she brought in this toaster to Walmart and it, and it was it was misshapen, it, it, it had lost its form, but when you turned it over you could see the make and the model. And she brought it in for replacement. And the store manager at the time said, oh gosh, ma'am, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but but the fact that the toaster isn't working anymore isn't the fault of the toaster. We're, you know, we can't replace that. Well, Sam Walton heard about that. And when he went to that store, he called that manager up in front of everybody in the store, all the employees. And he told that story and he said, our policy is that if you have an appliance that does not work, and you bring it to us and we sell that same make and model, we will replace your appliance free of charge. We're happy to do it. No questions asked at all. And I thought, wow, here is my sister, a very low-level employee at Walmart, who understood and could articulate Walmart's policy for replacing broken appliances. And I thought to myself, in the U.S. Forest Service, I don't know of anybody that could explain any Forest Service policy in any clearer terms than that. And then I wondered, why don't Forest Service leaders tell stories like that about the Forest Service? Well, that was a question I had on my mind for a long time, and I asked people about it. You know, why, why don't you tell stories? Well. Forest Service was full of, at that point, a, a lot of older white men, a lot of them with military backgrounds, telling stories. You know, no, you don't tell stories. You got a job to do. You do it. You keep your mouth closed. If you don't like doing that job, well, find a job someplace else. You no know, storytelling. Oh, <laughs> no. Well, it wasn't as though the organization didn't have stories because I was hearing stories, but. The stories I was hearing were from the old guys. We'd be out in the winter cruising timber. We'd stop to build a fire for lunch. We'd toast our sandwiches over the fire, and the old guys would tell stories. They'd tell stories about the guy that got in a car accident uh, with a government vehicle, and he had a fifth of whiskey under the seat, and the whiskey broke. He got in trouble for that. They talked about a young guy who had run his truck off the road in the middle of the night after being at the bar, decided he would walk up to the Forest Service office only a quarter mile away, and he would get the Forest Service four-wheel drive vehicle and pull himself out of the ditch. And he ended up getting suspended for that. And they talked about young guys who came in with new ideas on how to do things differently and better and they had to do things differently and better. And uh, the only way to get rid of that guy was, well, to promote him and send him to Washington, D.C. And after, after that happened, the old guys went back to doing the job the same way they had been doing it for years. So I, I learned a lot there. Uh, I learned that if, you know, if I got all drunked up and put my car in the ditch, I'd better not go walk up to the office and get the Forest Service four-wheel drive vehicle. I learned a little bit about motivations and demotivations. And then the old guy said, 30 days off without pay. You know, I could use that. I wouldn't mind that at all. So I learned a lot. But they weren't necessarily the stories that the organization really needed to have us know. And and for a long time, uh, I went all, um, I'd, I'd ask questions. You know, if somebody would get an award. Uh, forester of the year or biologist of the year well that was wonderful for that person it often met a cash cash award but if the organization was was asking us to pattern our behavior on the people that won the awards they never talked about that behavior that 
that generated that award, what had they accomplished? What obstacles had they overcome uh, in order to win that award? Or was it just an award that, you know, Forester of the Year, well, Joe had it last year, maybe Tom needs it next year. That, that's, you know, and maybe it just circulated by whoever was due for it. So I had lots of, lots of, of questions like that. A few years back, we had a going away party for a, a member of, a, a, a person who worked with us on the Tongass National Forest. And there was a card being circulated for us to sign it. You know, good luck, Rich, you know, uh, in your new job. And one of the, the leaders on the forest said, you know what? Everybody that signs that card, why don't you add one piece of advice? You know, something you've learned over the years uh, to give that to this person who is undertaking this, this new job in a, in a different place. And as a result, there were... 15 or 20 people who signed that card and they had a piece of advice to go with it. And I thought, well, that's really, that that's great. But you know what? Behind every piece of advice, every sentence, there's a story. Somebody had learned a lesson and that boiled down to what that advice was. So what I did is I went to each of those folks who had written that piece of advice and, and I had the, a, a photocopy of the, the going away card. I said, what's the story behind this piece of advice? Of course, most folks were pretty reluctant. Well, that's, you know, that's something I've learned over the years. You know, there's no, no story there. You know, okay. But in some cases, there were little vignettes and I, I wrote those down. And what I did is I created a, a Tongass Leadership Team Advice uh, compilation. Mm -hmm. And I kept that going for, for actually for, for several years in the, in the latter stages of my career. And when a new person came into the, to our leadership team, I would send it to them. I said, here's some of the accumulated wisdom that, that we've collected over the years. Uh, there might be some good advice in there for you. Maybe some of it is is pretty pretty standard stuff, but it'll give you an idea of how the members of this team that you're joining think. And we also gave that to folks who were uh, leaving the forest to take on uh, new responsibilities elsewhere. It got to the point where uh, some folks who heard about it said, "Hey, Pete, will you will you send us that uh, that?" Uh, Tongass leadership team tips. So that was, I was making some inroads on stories. And that was, uh, well, 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 that was, that was good. Uh, and when I left, uh, when I retired, I passed that on to uh, one of the other employees that, uh, uh, that had an interest in stories as well. And just before I finally did retire. I know that the safety folks in the U.S. Forest Service had picked up on storytelling as a way to to teach uh, uh, some of our policies and the reasons behind some of those policies. And what they did is they had us for a safety meeting sit down and talk about maybe some close calls we've had over the years. And that was that was pretty enlightening because everybody had safe call, uh, you know, close calls uh, as far as safety. And, and that was, oh, it was gratifying. Now, I think the Forest Service in general picked up a little bit on, on storytelling as a, as a value. Uh, they, they create a, a knowledge management group in the uh, in the Washington office, uh, and those folks, uh, a lot of them were historians, collected stories from, especially from uh, outgoing uh, employees or employees who had been retired for some time, wanting to capture some of those stories before they disappeared forever. Now, 
they talked to me and one of the things I said, well, and this is great, how do you disseminate that information and those stories that you've collected? Well, they, they didn't. They didn't disseminate them. They're there if anybody wants to look, but there was there was a gap between collecting of the stories and 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 how the stories are used. So I think we've we we the Forest Service still has a ways to go there. But that's one of the ways I came to storytelling. I, I, I found that stories and organizations are really critical for passing on uh, some of the values of the organization. And it wasn't until I was in the organization that halfway through my career, I started learning some things that it would have been good for young employees to know right off the bat. One, I came into the organization as a wildlife biologist. It was an, and it's an organization, the Forest Service, at that time, in the early 70s, it was run by foresters and engineers. Didn't really have a lot of use for wildlife biologists because, for the most part, they all hunted and fished, the foresters and the engineers. So, of course, they cared about fish and wildlife, and they didn't need some uh, young guy right out of college telling them that, that they were wrong or telling them that they ought to be doing things differently. Well, they also... Uh, Oh, gosh, the founder of the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, at the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, in the 1890s, uh, was a great influence on, on public lands in the U.S. Uh, he'd read a book, uh, gosh, I think it was Man and Nature, that was printed in 1876. And what this was, this book, Man and Nature, was a treatise on the decline of civilizations based on their loss of their forests. I think it was primarily in the mid Middle East uh, uh, that he based this uh, uh, this book on. But Pinchot uh, took that to heart and he said what the nation needs to do instead of giving away all the public lands, it needed to reserve public lands for public benefit for, for years to come. And as a result, that's how we ended up with forest reserves that were reserved from, from homesteading, uh, that were kept in the public domain. And, and of course, now we have, we have uh, this nation has natural resources like, like few others in the, in the world. We have these forests and grasslands and parks that are reserved for public use. And that's a, that's a, a wonderful thing. Some folks in the environmental movement argue, you know, the, the, the foresters argue with the, the wilderness advocates, oh, we shouldn't be cutting trees, oh, we, we should be cutting trees. We can have that public discussion because of people like Gifford Pinchot, who led the effort to, to, to create and, and maintain these public lands. Now, early in my career, when I said, well, God, we need a four-wheel drive to get around through the woods, uh, people would say, well, Gifford Pinchot didn't have a four-wheel drive. Oh, that's, that's true. Gifford Pinchot had a horse. You know, gosh, you know, we, we need to drive an hour to get to our project site. We start out at 7 o'clock in the morning. It'd be nice to have a radio to listen to. Well, old Gift didn't have a radio. Yeah, he didn't have a truck either. In every one of our offices, we had a copy of Pinchot's Maxims. And the maxims, uh, they were kind of like the Ten Commandments. Only, only we had eleven of them. Oh, Pinchot's Guide to the Behavior of Foresters in Public Office. A public official is there to serve the public and not run them. Um, let's see. Find out in advance what the public will stand for, and if it's right and they won't stand for it, postpone your project and and educate them. Uh, Get rid of an attitude of personal arrogance or pride in attainment or, sur or superior knowledge. Don't try any sly or foxy politics. A forester is not a politician. It was, it was, uh, it was good advice, and and folks would always point point at that. You know, on the wall, you know, there's Gifford Pinchot's maxims. You need to stick to that. Uh, but there were nobody uh, that was quoting. Uh, Thoreau, there was nobody who was uh, quoting Barry Commoner, uh, nobody quoting the environmentalists of, of the time. Uh, and so it, 
you know, I, I was I was pretty prejudiced against Gifford Pinchot, but later in my career, as I learned more, uh, Gifford Pinchot is the reason we're even able to have some of these discussions on on how we manage public lands in the future. And that's a story that I wish that I had heard coming into the organization rather than the here's the job, uh, do it this way. Uh, if you don't like it, you know, go someplace else, find a different job. But anyway, so that's that's how I came to understand the values of story uh, in organizations. And if the organization didn't have official stories, there were going to be stories, and they weren't all necessarily wonderful stories. So that's that's what brought me to storytelling, and that is also uh, what has guided a lot of my storytelling in the time since I've retired. I've been, I've talked to, uh, uh, since my retirement, I've talked to the naturalists at the visitor centers about, about uh, natural history interpretation and messages that we want to get across to the public. Uh, just this past month, I spent an hour telling stories to uh, new employees uh, of the Forest Service in the Alaska region, you know, kind of telling them what's unique about this place in Alaska and some of the stories that, uh, that I've collected over the years uh, from, my, from my experiences in Alaska. Uh, you know, I've got uh, you know, my uh, Diary of a Forest Ranger, which is one of the CDs, the one Tom mentioned that I had done in public, uh, it did a, a live performance that was all based on things that I had learned about myself and about the Forest Service, about the public, There's things I'd learned anywhere uh, uh, in my 37 years with the Forest Service. And that, uh, Tom mentioned it, uh, that was broadcast on television in Alaska, won a, won a Goldie, it's the best entertainment program, uh, which was wonderful. And that became uh, a book uh, stories of a forest ranger, in which I included a lot of stories that I didn't have time uh, to include in that in that one hour performance. So that's kind of kind of it in a nutshell, a very large nutshell of where I am uh, and what I'm doing these days. And I guess at, at this point, if you have any questions for me. Uh, I would, uh, I'd, I'd love to answer them or, or if they're uh, too controversial, I'll, I'll skirt around them. I've got a lot of experience as a government bureaucrat in how to get around answering tough questions. Pete, since I brought up the skunk whisperer, um, maybe I, I see that as a kind of leadership story. Uh, <laughs> And I'm wondering if you could uh, share some version of, of that with us. Sure. Yeah, when I uh, uh, started to expand my uh, career horizons and, and look for uh, gaining experience outside the field of wildlife biology, I transferred from Michigan to Minnesota as an assistant ranger for other resources, other in the terminology of the US Forest Service is other means anything other than timber. So I had recreation and trails and, and manpower programs, special uses, lands, fire suppression, wildlife biology. And this was this was new to me. Managing campgrounds was a was a new thing to me. So I, I toured the campground uh, when I first got there with with one of my employees, the, the guy that Tom who ran the campground. And we looked at all the campsites, we looked at you know, this and that, and opened up a shed, here's our storage set, and, and in there, there was a stack of wire traps, have a heart, live traps. I said, Tom, what, what do you use the live traps for? And he said, skunks. He said, we got a bunch of skunks around the campground. When they get too bad, we, we live trap them. I said, wow, that's great. You, you live trap the skunks, and most people would just kill them. And Tom looks at me like I was born yesterday. He says, well, get them in the trap. We tie a rope to the trap. We drag it over to the harbor, and then we drown them. Oh, man, no. We can't. No, 
we're not going to do that anymore. It, it's, it's wrong to kill animals just because you don't like the way they make a living. So, so the next time we trap a skunk, we're, we're going to release it in the wild, you know, several miles away. It won't come back. Well, okay. So several months after that, I'm in the office and I get a call on the radio. And it was Tom. Uh, it be, we got that. Uh, we got the big stinker last night. What do you want us to do with it? Oh, well, the big stinker had been terrorizing the campground for like the last week. You know, spraying dogs, startling people on the paths at night, getting into people's food. Well, Tom knew exactly what I wanted him to do with that skunk. But then I realized that this was a test. Tom had never released a skunk from a live trap before. And he had asked me, well, Pete, have you ever done that before? Oh, no, I had. So I said, okay, Tom, you know, hang on, just wait, and I'll be out in a few minutes. So I jumped in a green pickup, drove out to the campground to where they had this skunk. And there's Tom and a couple of interested campers out there, you know, about, you know, 100 feet upwind of this huge skunk in this wire trap. And so I backed the truck up to the trap and, and I looked at that skunk and he filled the trap. Oh, it just absolutely magnificent, silky black fur, you know, the, the, the color of midnight and, the, and this white stripe that started on his forehead and widened out over the top of his head and down his back and out his tail, a cover, a color of a, of a, a, a thunderhead cloud on a, on a summer day. And and gleaming beady eyes. Oh man, it, it was beautiful. And I was a little hesitant. I wasn't quite sure how to do this. So I sat on the tailgate of the pickup truck and I talked to that skunk, telling it what I was going to do and what I expected of it. And because I was in the Leech Lake uh, band of the Chippewa uh, reservation, I used every word in the Chippewa language that I knew. You know, Buju Mishomas, you know, greetings, grandfather. Uh, Pete in Dijnikaz, Walker in Donjaba. My name is Pete, I live in Walker. Giniwin Ganiwin da Kigai Dush, Widakau, Bimadizajig. We care for the earth and we help our friends. Mandwe on a mood, the voice of the wind in the pine trees. Yeah. Gichi Maguetch. Great thanks. So this took several minutes. I calmed down. I thought the skunk had calmed down too, and I very gently put a, a, a canvas cover over the trap, and I very gently loaded it into the back of the pickup, closed the tailgate. And I drove to a place about five or six miles away. We called the Wood Tick Fields, an old farm field in the National Forest. Well, there was there were some ponds where there'd be frogs and tadpoles for the skunks to eat, and and field mice, and and places where yellow jackets nested in the ground. And skunks like yellow jacket nests, so you know it was a kind of a skunk heaven. And so there in the field, I. I reversed the process, opened the tailgate, set the trap on the ground, took the cover off, sat on the tailgate and talked to the skunk for another five minutes or so, trying to calm it down. And then came the time when it was time to release the skunk. And I realized that my plan had a flaw in that I would have to touch the trap and hold the gate open for the skunk to escape. It was a spring-loaded uh, door and I had no way of holding it open other than with my finger. So I opened the door, held it open, and I said, okay skunk, you can go now. You can, you can leave. Well, the only way out of that trap was for the skunk, the skunk had to back out. It couldn't turn around in the trap and it wasn't gonna back out when it couldn't see what was going on behind it. 
So, so I tilted the trap up. You can go now, skunk. You can go now. It still didn't. So I tilted the trap up a little bit more, and I shook it, and he is in there hanging on to the wire mesh with his claws. And I said, you can go now, and I just gave it a shake, and it fell out of the trap and hit the ground. I closed my eyes. I opened him up, and all I could see was his tail standing straight up in his back end, staring at me directly. I closed my eyes again, waiting for the blast that never came. And, and 10 seconds later, I opened my eyes, and the skunk was waddling out through the grass into its new home. Well, loaded up the trap, threw the canvas in the truck, drove back to the campground. Tom and the interested campers are still standing about the same spot I'd left them. Well, upwind. Tom said, yeah, how'd it go, Pete? And I said, nothing to it, Tom. All you have to do is talk to him. And I realized that that, that, that whole thing was, it, it was a lesson in leadership. Tom had some reservations about doing this thing. And he was testing me to see if I was going to make him do something that I had never done before myself. And <laughs> it worked out. Now, in, in, the, in the time since then, I've talked to other folks who have live trapped skunks. And they tell me that their success rate is about 50-50 <laughs> in releasing skunks without getting sprayed. And I'm sure it's just because they did not know how to talk to them be, to begin with. So that that was my that was my skunk whisperer tale. That uh, uh, one of my uh, one of my first CDs was entitled "The Skunk Whisperer." Thanks, Pete. I I love that story and <laughs> love the <laughs> learnings from it. Yeah, one of the things I have learned is that the stories I tell, I may be the protagonist, technically even the hero, but is not the hero that conquers all. It's then the hero that <laughs> that uh, runs into obstacles that have puzzled me, and and I've made my way through them not by dint of being a hero, but just by by <laughs> uh, trial and error. And, and you learn as much from the errors as you, you do by the successes. You know, I, I have a follow-up question. And I, one of the things, uh, I didn't know that you were Chippewa. Um, ah. um, but um, I, I was just wondering, is, is it something that you regularly did of kind of like talk to the animals as you did certain things. Um, I know you're an avid hunter. Um, is there kind of blessings that you do with the animals as you hunt or eh, just kind of interested in that communication, interspecies communication? Yeah, it, it's the, uh, uh, certainly always a great respect. And, and, and I'll be honest, it, you know, in growing up, uh, my my parents had differing opinions uh, about uh, about wildlife. My dad was a very much a good guys, bad guys uh, uh, philosophy on, on wildlife. There were good wildlife, there were bad wildlife. My mother, on the other hand, was a pretty much you know everything was good, everything had a right to live, uh, and. And if you were going to kill something, it better be because uh, you had to, or it, it was something you were going to eat. My dad, on the other hand, you know, predators were bad. Uh, and so hawks and owls got shot, weasels got shot. That was you know, because they ate uh, some of the, the wildlife species that we liked, like deer and, and, and rough grouse uh, and, and snowshoe hares, things like that. So uh, on the one hand, my, my mother, who from, you know, my mother was a, a tribal member. Uh, she had this sense that everything, everything deserved to live. Uh, 
and you, you really needed to be very thoughtful in the taking of any life. Dad, on the other hand, was uh, um, not quite that way. <laughs> so, you know, growing up, it was between the two worlds, and, and at this point in, in my life, I'm very much more like, like mom. Uh, in if I'm going to shoot something, it's because uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be eaten. So, as far as rituals, no, I, I don't I don't do uh, rituals. Further further up the, the line in in the family, there were some some rituals putting down tobacco for uh, um, the, in memory of the the animal that has given its life uh, to sustain our own. For me, it's more of a, uh, not a subconscious thing, but something I hold more, more to myself. Uh, don't feel, you know, glory in when I walk up to the moose that I've just killed. It's more of a, oh, gee, you know, this is a wonderful animal that was, you know, a few minutes ago was, was alive. Uh, but, you know, that's going to sustain us through the through the through the winter too so that's uh no rituals but it's uh but but very much a thought process of, of, of mine thanks pete other questions that people have for So I want to just say thank you, Pete. I mean, no, I don't have a question right now, but I'm just thinking, I mean, reading the chat where everybody's just um, speaking about how beautiful you describe things and um, highlight the small and big things about, and the skunk, it's not usually on the top of our list of things we think of as <laughs> magnificent because I've been reading uh, all the, the posts here. So uh, it's just to, to put us in the moment too, like we could see you in the woods and, thinking and, and, and wondering like, mm, I was the leader here. I came up with this idea, is this gonna work? <laughs> so, and I love you saying when you got back, how everyone was staying a little far away <laughs> till they got the full report. So uh, yeah, it is a series of errors, but I think that's the beauty of the stories you tell and uh, when you can make it um, approachable in which you do. And uh, the small things are just as powerful as the big moments. Well, well, thank you for this that. Is Alice. Yes, go ahead, Allison. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'll let you respond. I'm sorry. Let's let you respond first. Oh, I, I, yeah. The the chat on the side. I haven't been able to keep up with it because I'm looking looking uh, at at the screen all the time. Um, okay. Well, anyway, go ahead, Allison. You have a question. Um, I wanted to thank you as well. That was just. It was really quite beautiful. Um. And I've loved uh, listening to you, to that story and then picturing how you are um, uh, using that, applying that for, for leadership. Um, and I, I will echo back everything that you're seeing in the chat there as well. I'm curious, when you started doing this work and you recognized the importance of stories, um, do you feel like at this point, because that, that was a while ago when you started doing that, do you feel like um, the field uh, whether it's forestry or any of these other fields that you've been working in are more uh, actively open to it at this point? I, I think there's, I think there's a, a growing acceptance, but I don't think it's been quite fully embraced to this point. Uh, you know, there's uh, the Forest Service has established a, a knowledge management uh, group in the uh, in the uh, Washington office, which is probably the worst place to start a program, <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> uh, that's a good way to hide things. Uh, but there, there, there are folks like the, the safety people, uh, people in charge of the safety programs that have embraced storytelling as a way uh, to pass along uh, the, the, the reasons and the values for, for the safety program. And one of the, one of the things I've, I've learned in the past uh, few years, and actually just before I, I retired, was uh, somebody had asked me to talk to a group of employees at a safety meeting. 
And what I did is I told them stories about four employees that I had, you know, come to come to know uh, over the course of my career. Wonderful people. I had a couple of vignettes about all of them. And then, you know, uh, Jim had died in a forest fire and Ricardo had been swept mm. over a falls uh, uh, and was lost forever. Devin uh, had been out in the woods when a tree uh, 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 had, had fallen on him. Uh, and, and another Leon who had uh, spent the night on a mountaintop weathered in uh, and had managed to uh, get down the mountain to the point where he could see the helicopter waiting for him uh, when he slipped and he fell uh, over a cliff. And those folks, you know, those folks weren't going to be enjoying the things that I was about to enjoy a, a, a nice retirement and they'd left families behind. And those are the mm -hmm. things that stick with people rather than a, oh, always mm -hmm. wear your life jacket, always buckle your seat belt. Yeah, make sure of your footing when you're on the mountain. Uh, gosh, when there's a fire burning, you need to know where your escape routes are. And and it, it's stories like that that pass mm -hmm. on, uh, I, I think, deeper deeper meanings than, than simply the, the iteration of a policy. Okay, that's really, yeah, that's very helpful. And did you, you, you had said that, um, you had sort of combined the stories, compiled the, the stories, not just for the safety, but for, um, as people are becoming onboarded, you know, for training new people. Yes. Did you, uh, were they all written or would you, or did you create a, um, uh, like a, uh, it was there a regular um, integrated kind of institutionalized uh, time for stories? Was that uh, no. actually part? Was that part of their training, or was it something that we just, you know, it, was it was it an active thing like that that it was institutionalized, or how did you do that? Uh, no, this was this is more of an informal effort that the people on the on the leadership team supported, uh, but it was basically me compiling these stories that I had uh, learned, uh, some 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 uh, uh, because of my own actions. But others, other times, uh, a ranger passed on. Uh, uh, they were doing some uh, some some blasting in uh, near near a small town, and they thought they were pretty far away. But they did some blasting, and people were were panicked. They thought there was earthquake. They're wondering about this and that. And and the ranger and his staff had to go out into the community the 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 day after and talk to folks about what they had been doing and why mm. and the lesson there was you know maybe we ought to let the public know before setting off explosions out, <laughs> in, the, out in the woods which is actually one of my stories too <laughs> uh you mix, oh, wow. mix uh, forest service and explosions and and there are there are lots of stories about uh mishaps <laughs> and some some on the humorous side yeah, I can imagine. Thank you yeah, so, so much. So it I wasn't really a, appreciate your time. Yeah, Allison. Yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't a standard program. It wasn't a time where he said, "Okay, uh, here in in your training and in, in getting into the Alaska region, here are the stories you need to know." There'd be a quiz at right. the end. We we didn't we we didn't do it that way. Yeah, <laughs> feature Thank stories you. are are very inspiring to me to remember all the stories in my own life and how they could be woven into the work that I do. I really appreciate it, thank you. Oh, you bet. It's, uh, one of the things I found was even in doing the, the natural history stories I did on the radio, uh, five minute essays about, uh, about natural history, there was a way to work in my previous experiences, the things I'd learned uh, growing up that weren't necessarily true uh, and, and even, uh, values that uh, uh, that I now embrace that you know are, are completely well I, I did a piece on song sparrows uh, when I was in uh, college I learned about uh, song sparrows and, and a, a lady Mrs. Nice had done a treatise on song sparrows in 1937 and 
I, I did an essay on that uh, for the radio. It, and my contention was even folks who were not trained can add to uh, public knowledge. Uh, and the example was Mrs. Nice, who had done this uh, treatise on song sparrows in 1937. But in, in looking up the whole uh, Mrs. Nice and the song sparrows, I came across the name of Margaret Morse, who had attended college in the late 1800s, uh, graduated with a, a teaching degree, and then had gone on to earn a master's in biology. And, and she had uh, done a lot of work in wildlife, birds in particular. And along the way, she'd gotten married to a professor from Clark University. And it turns out that this uh, professor from Clark University was named Nice. So Margaret Morris became Margaret Nice. And she was a became well-known, renowned expert in birds, bird behavior, and song sparrows in particular. And she was invited to speak to the Audubon societies, the ornithological societies, different groups that she wasn't allowed to join because she was a woman. And, you know, in the springtime, when I hear song sparrows sing, and they're one of the first birds to hear in the, in the spring, in the north anyway, I always thought of Mrs. Nice. And now when I hear song sparrows sing in the spring, I think of Margaret Morse, uh, and, and, and it's a wonderful story. Uh, I think I might, it might be on one of my YouTube channels about uh, Mrs. Nice and, and the Song Sparrows. So, you know, and I wondered in that biology class that I attended as a freshman in, in, in college, you know, why they didn't mention Margaret Morse rather than just meant, you know, say Mrs. Nice. And I, I realized it was a, it was a class in biology, not necessarily a, a class in sociology, but that's one of the things that I learned along the way. And one of my other things is you're never too old to learn. And I just love coming across new things, things I'd never contemplated before uh, that changed the way I look at the world. Yeah. I love that too. And, and I was thinking as you spoke of Mrs. Nice, how in, in when I was young, um, it was customary to address a woman by her husband's name. So Mrs. Albert Nice, uh, <laughs> not uh -huh. even Mrs. Margaret Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> or, or the saying was um, when a man and a woman get married and they become one and he's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> well, Pete, going. I, I'm in Edmonton, so um, ah. Edmonton, Alberta. So we're not that far away. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Barbara. Um, Pete, uh, just as we wrap up here, maybe you could reflect on what you thought you would be getting into <laughs> seven years ago when you joined the board, and maybe some of the highlights uh, that you've experienced in these seven years as a board member? Yeah, seven years ago when the, the, uh, the, the storytelling and organizations uh, group was about to dissolve and the, the leadership of NSN sent out a notice to, to, to all the members, uh, uh, SIO is going to go away, you know, unless there are some folks to, uh, that are interested in, in keeping it going. So I raised my hand thinking that I would be one of dozens of people and I could hide in the anonymity of numbers. But no, there were four people that raised their hands. Uh, 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 Tom was one, uh, gosh, uh, Easter, Easter was another, Mark was another, and me. Luckily, of the four, there are only three positions on the board, the chair, the vice chair, and the secretary treasurer. And I kind of, weaseled out of getting any uh, of the of the uh, positions, but they kept me on the board anyway as an advisor. Okay, so <laughs> uh, in, and it was it was wonderful. I'd known Tom from uh, from uh, Cincinnati when I attended the NSN conference there and, and attended his uh, God's Week Off juggling uh, uh, show, uh, and I was just kind of blown away by that. Uh, but anyway, 
uh, we had uh, uh, pre-conference. Uh, we had a member of the Forest Service the, from the Knowledge Management Team uh, at, at the pre-conference. And over the years, um, well, Easter left and, well, okay, I became the secretary treasurer. And, and then Tricia came and Mark left and, and, and more folks came, came in. And, you know, some of the folks that I had known in storytelling from over the years, we had them at pre-conferences, we had them for the story labs. And, and I think one of the highlights is, is attracting a, a worldwide audience. And, and I think having Artem and, and Stuart, uh, uh, you know, join us has, has been just terrific. And I feel really doggone comfortable that this organization is going to keep going and, and going. And with uh, uh, Jules uh, heading up the effort, you know, uh, I, I, I think this is, I think this is terrific. Uh, I learned some new skills. I took on the uh, 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 the newsletter, so I had to learn a new skill there. You know, for old rangers, that that's difficult. But I did it. <laughs> yes, you did. You did it well. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's <laughs> it's it's been great. It, it's been wonderful people. Uh, wonderful story labs. Uh, it's been just a pleasure working with, with all you folks. Wow, thank you, Pete, uh, for your stories, for your knowledge, for all your efforts over these past years. And um, looking forward to just attending some story labs and uh, seeing your face and um, continuing to benefit from your <laughs> stories. And your next book, which is in the works. Ah, that it is. That it is. And I would just like to say, uh, if uh, anyone is thinking about this, uh, Stories of a Forest Ranger, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's just, if you like uh, stories that show the value rather than tell the value, uh, this is just a great example of that book. In good writing, they often say, you know, show it, don't tell it. And I think Pete's book does that so well. It reminds me of one of my all-time favorite books, which, which is uh, All Creatures Great and Small. Um, it's just all these tales of, of forestry and the people and the animals. And very well done. So highly recommend that you get Pete's book, which is available on Amazon or from Pete himself if you want a signed copy, which say your website again, Pete. Uh, the storytelling ranger.com. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The all creatures great and small. One of my lectures on the cruise ships is Alaska creatures big and little. <laughs> Yeah, all the way from whales to shrews. <laughs> yes. And we'll turn it back over to Jules to finish up our time here. Yes, I'm going to smile and say thank you and also invite um, the group, uh, whoever would like to stay on for a few minutes. We're having an, a short board me uh, meeting, a member meeting right after the call. And then I was smiling as Pete explained his joining process, because I think that is a leadership quality I've learned from both of you about how I've gotten involved with the uh, the stories and organization group. They lure you in, nice conversations and saying, come just join us, do a little bit. They don't no pressure on putting a title in yourself. Don't worry about that. And then suddenly you find out you're, you're showing up a lot more than you thought and stretching and doing more things. I have these two gentlemen to uh, give credit to for my first Zoom experiences. <laughs> they encouraged me, just hit the button. <laughs> so with that happy note, if you're not staying on the call, have a happy, wonderful and safe Thanksgiving. And then we will let you know when our next story call is. It's going to be in December. It's a story swap and it's usually our personal stories. So we're gonna figure out what our theme's gonna be in a few minutes. 
So do stay on and I'm going to stop the recording and wish you all a great day in the meantime. Take care.